Would you uh, take your Bible and, and, and turn with me to Galatians chapter 3? We'll read this uh, just a wonderful passage, verses 10 through 13, uh, 14, rather, um, because it's too good not to be true. And the reason I say it that way is because no fool man could ever think this stuff up. Ever heard that, you know, fact is stranger than fiction? Well, this is better than fiction. You know, I think of Hannah and Drew who served Jesus Christ in South Asia and the weirdo gods, you know, some of them with six arms and are yucky looking and some with horrible masks and the similarity with that and the, the indigenous peoples of the desert southwest and the plains here in the United States and the masks that they put on to imitate the gods. They're terrible. They're ugly. They're threatening. They're mean. They're ugly. Imagine what that must do to a small Indian child, be that an Indian child in the desert southwest or or in South Asia. And how that drills into the child, I am afraid of God. God is going to hurt me. But then we, we have the gospel of peace. Let's read verses 10 through 14. I'll read it aloud. This is the New American Standard um, 1995 update, very similar to the ESV. For as many, this is verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. It is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that he would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Moses mentioned to Joshua that uh, in Deuteronomy that when they entered into the promised land, they need to go to two mountains, Gerizim and Ebal. And at the foot of those two mountains to read the blessings and the curses of the law. That some people would be under Mount Gerizim where it was blessing and others would be at the foot of Ebal. And they would read these things. And, and you'll read that they did that in Joshua chapter 8. But this, this passage reminds me of it. There, there's kind of an interweaving. It starts with blessing, actually in verse 9. And then it goes into cursing. And then it pulls us back out again in verse 14 with blessing. But, but it really gets down to where the rubber meets the road. It talks about why there's blessing now and forever and why there's cursing now and forever. I just realized I'm not even on my sermon. So <laughs> there we go. Now this is going to take an extra half hour. <laughs> not kidding. Not true. Not true. But the question is this in verse 10. Are you relying on the law? And the tendency for us Americans is, nah, man, I, I, I'm not under any law. I don't want to pay any attention to the law. I, I've got a buddy, a high school buddy. I haven't seen him in uh, 51 years. 
So it's been recent. Um, but he was two years ahead of me, and he's, he's the drummer of the, of the Marshall Tucker Band. That means he's dadgum good. He is. He's a great drummer. And he, I, I didn't know it, but uh, he was inducted into the our high school Hall of Fame. Who, who knew we had such a thing? Well, he was. And I remember one of the things he said was he quoted Frank Sinatra. And he said, right or wrong, I did it my way. Oh, no, Barry. <laughs> Don't do it your way. Because the tendency is for to say, see, I'm not under any law, I'm not under anything. That is the definition of being under the law. You say, no, I, mean, I don't pay any attention to the Ten Commandments. Well, we know that. But even if you thought you did, you're not doing a good job at it. It doesn't matter whether you're tightening yourself up and trying to do everything right and everything wrong. Or, or and doing everything wrong, I might say, or if you don't even give a rip and you're just doing it your way, you're still under the law because you're depending on yourself. We were in the Sunday school, we were, I was thinking about this, and uh, sorry, Steve, my mind wandered, but uh, <laughs> but. I think when we were talking about the, uh, what was it, the uh, sixth commandment about killing and how you, you know, and I hope you do, that you're, you're a liar. And you think, well, well, that's sweet of you to think of that. Well, now here's, here's what I mean. The most dangerous lying of all is not to me, and it's not even to the government, the government, sorry. Um, it's to yourself. We are master self-deceivers. We're so good that we don't even know we're lying to ourselves. I, I, uh, I went to a Bible school run by a narcissist a clinical narcissist who could not ever admit that he was wrong. I used the tractor one day and I put it back in the barn and a few days later he got on the tractor. This was a diesel tractor. You know where I'm going with this. And he started using it. And guess what he did? He ran out of diesel fuel. Now, my understanding is when a diesel engine runs out of diesel fuel, not good things happen. And he came and found where I was because he learned that I was the last one who used it. And he started reaming me out for not putting it in the barn with a full tank. Oh, I wanted to say, well, what fool would go out and start using the dadgum tractor without checking the diesel fuel in the tank. But I didn't say it. But he could not admit he was ever wrong. And that wasn't the only example. Everything was everybody else's fault. That's because a clinical narcissist lies to himself or herself. I'm okay, you're not okay. That's, that's what, that's not just clinical narcissism, that's us. I'm okay, you're not, but I'm okay. I'm fine. And we defend ourselves, we create little motifs and stories in our brains that, that prove that we think of ourselves over and over again in this way. We're lying. We're lying. And that's why we need to fellowship together so that people like Jeremy can say, you're a lying son of a gun. We need Jeremy to say, you're lying. Or when he's being gentle, you know that ain't so. 
And that's good. It's not the gift of discouragement that you think it is. It's the gift of holding us accountable. And that's a good thing. And we all need to be there. We are blind. I was thinking also, sorry, again in in Sunday school. You know how many people went to A.W. Pink's funeral? A.W. Pink, for crying out loud, pretty prolific. Five people. Five. Do you know why? Because he cloistered himself. Was it you who said that, Glenn, about cloistering ourselves or, or, or someone in Sunday school? A.W. Pink shut himself off and only communicated with the outside by letter writing. That's my understanding. I may have it wrong. Five people were at his funeral. Dr. Pink didn't have people to tell him, Arthur, you're lying to yourself. You're wrong. He was right about a lot. A whole lot. But he needed it. Have you ever, you know, I don't own a Peloton bike and I have no intention of investing the multiple thousands of dollars for what looks to me like a stationary exercise bike. Now, I could, I could be wrong, but I know this from the commercials. You can hop on that Peloton bike and you can go riding with people. And they can, you know, they stand up and say, you're doing great, you're doing great. Well, you know, they can't see you. Keep it up, keep it up. We're going to take a little jaunt through the Swiss Alps today and you run, 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 run on the bike and then you, you pedal, you sprint and then you take off and you, you slow down. And after an hour or whatever, I couldn't last an hour, you hop off and you realize you hadn't moved an inch. You didn't see the Alps, you saw a video, and I could do that without getting on a dad go bike for a lot cheaper. They have a lot of nice documentaries on Prime Video. When we live under the law, we can think we're doing fine. We can think we're seeing things and growing spiritually, but we're not. We're not making one iota of progress by doings and don'tings. And, and Donna, you were right. The, 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 the understanding that most people have of Christianity is, well, I don't want to become a Christian because then I can't X, Y, or Z. That is not the essence of Christianity. Oh my word, that's Mormonism. Just a dying Mormon. You're talking about Mormonism. No, 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 no. no. Christianity says you aren't good and you're going to always fight in this life about that. But this is Christianity. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He redeemed us from being cursed by God. And you may think, well, that doesn't sound right. God, why why would He curse me? Oh, here's why. He owns you. Remember how Psalm 100 says, we did not make ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. We didn't design ourselves. There is one Creator God who's made things. And we are trespassers. Formerly, you know, in the Robin Hood era, I think uh, King John was the king, the same guy that had to uh, sign the Magna Carta. You were not allowed onto the king's property to hunt deer. It didn't matter whether you were hungry or not. 
And if you were caught hunting deer on the king's property, you were arrested and probably lost your life. Our Lord, now that's not a great illustration, but our Lord is Master of the universe. He is the Creator of the universe. He owns it. And He is holy. And He is just. And when His holiness and justice is violated, because He is a God who does not have is a respecter of persons, everyone who has violated His law must pay. And by the way, the moment you figure out how important it is to keep the law, it's already too late. Because you may start trying to keep the law, but the problem is, is that you don't have anything that has paid for the law you violated all those years before. There's nothing there. You can start saying, well, I'll repent. Repentance is a biblical word, but it rests on something. Repentance and faith rest on something. You can repent and believe all you want. But if Jesus Christ had not died and paid for your sin, that is an empty repentance and it's an empty faith. You may think, well, you know, I'll just stop. I'll just quit doing what I'm doing. I'll get better. Come on, man. That's that's when we need to send a Jeremy to your house and ring the doorbell and say, you're lying. You're not telling yourself the truth. It's too late. The minute you realize it, it's too late. We're born children of wrath. We're born lawbreakers. We break the law because we are lawbreakers. We didn't become lawbreakers. We are lawbreakers. The, the Word of God in Deuteronomy 27, 26, which is referred here, it says, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. You know what's interesting in Deuteronomy 27? It says, And the people said, Amen. Wow. They signed their own death warrants by saying, Amen. I agree. James 2 makes it very clear. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder, do not commit adultery, but do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. When I taught apologetics at um, the Christian high school, I had a phrase. It was called murder, rape, and blueberry pie. And you may think, what on earth have those got to do with anything? And I was trying to teach those kids that it doesn't matter the degree to which you sin. I'm, I'm from a Viking background. I was a Norman. A Norman means Norseman. Even though we came from France to to kill Anglo-Saxons. But what did we do? What did my forefathers do? We murdered, we pillaged, we raped. That's my background. Uh, I didn't personally get involved in, in that, thankfully. But what about I used to say to them, what about the old grandma who makes blueberry pies for all her neighbors and takes them over to them to their house, yet she does not trust in Jesus Christ as her, as her righteousness, as her sin bearer. Murder, rape, and blueberry pie, it's all the same. You're already, you're already done for. You're already cursed of God. Well, I don't feel cursed. Right? That doesn't have a thing to do with it. Feeling will lead you down the wrong path. If faith 
and if fact and faith are not ahead of feeling, you're done for. If feeling is your locomotive, you're going to, like it happened in India the other day, you're going to derail and hundreds were killed. 800, I believe, were killed in that derailment. It's crazy. Feeling's the wrong locomotive. God is impartial. Do you realize that? We always like to say God is impartial when we get passed over for something. In Julie's high school, every single... She went to a small uh, Episcopal private school in Jackson. In her senior class, every single girl got the designation of class beauty except Julie and one other girl. And they were passed over on purpose. The the teacher who decided who beauties were, her daughter was beaten out on the cheerleading squad by Julie because she was better. So her senior year, she wasn't a class beauty. And that's when we love to say, well, God's impartial. He sees it. And there's, to, to a very minor degree, that's true. But don't forget, it, that, that's a two-edged sword that cuts both ways. You may think, I've been treated wrong. God's going to get you. Be careful. It ain't about you. It ain't about you. He's not going to get somebody because of the way they treated you. He will deal with all sin. Trust Him. But you're not the cutting edge, cute little child that He's going to defend because you're really something. You've you've heard of people with dimples in their cheeks and People like me, you can't see it, but have a dimple on their chin. The, the, the theory is, is that God said to the people with dimples in their cheeks, you're so cute. And to those who have dimples in their chin, get away from me. <laughs> but, you know, that's not so. But we tend to think that we're the dimpled cutie. As a child in the Southern Baptist Church, I used to turn around and stare at people. You know, you know that kid. Turn around, kid. You're bothering me. Well, I would turn around and, and I would look over. And I, I, This is stupid, so I'm telling you the truth of how we lied. I was convinced I was a really cute kid and that I, somebody was going to kidnap me because I was so cute. <laughs> Isn't that stupid? But it's true. That's what I actually thought as a five-year-old, as a Southern Baptist five-year-old. <laughs> Bad theology. God is not going to get people because you've been mistreated by them. He's going to deal with them because of their relationship to Him and His law. But good news, verse 13 again, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. I cannot think of more astounding words in the English or any other language than those words. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Do you know that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter in the earliest of preachings in the book of Acts, in chapters 5, I believe 10, and then in, ver- in chapter 13, they talk about Jesus Christ being put to death on a tree. Now, they had plenty of examples in their preaching, also in the book of Acts, of talking about Christ being put to death on the cross, Christ being put to death, etc., but they purposefully chose a tree because also in Deuteronomy it says, and it says it here in the passage, cursed 
is everyone who hangs on a tree. Our Lord did not owe a cursing to be cursed by God the Father. It wasn't His to be cursed, but He became a curse. He chose to become a curse. Do you remember in Luke when he was in his own village and he really gave the folk a zinger in the synagogue and they got so angry they pushed him out of the synagogue and got to the brow of a cliff and intended to push him off and kill him? It said a very strange thing. And he simply walked back through the crowd. Now that's weird. How did He survive? Our Lord being very very God and very man designed to die on a cross. To die on a tree so that He could redeem you from the curse of the law so that He could be a curse in our stead. What is a curse? One, you are completely and perpetually displeasing to God. Have you ever felt that way towards someone? Maybe a parent that you could never make them happy, no matter what you did. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it's a spouse. No matter what you do, you can't make them happy. You cannot please them. They're never happy with you. You're always less than. When that's true between you and God, when God finds you a displeasure, there is hell to pay, literally. Not only are you displeasing to Him, but you are under His wrath And you may think, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Dear one, if you think you're fine without Jesus Christ, your ignorance is judgment. Your inability to understand, your inability to see the importance of Christ's finished work is judgment. And that's called judicial deafness. And that's a scary thing. It's a a horrible, horrible thing to read what our Lord Himself said in Matthew 25, verse 41. Then He said to those on His left, Depart from Me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devils and His angels. And he summed up that passage when they started making excuses. He said, then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now that sounds like we have to jump through hoops to be nice, to help people. That's not true. It's evidence that Christ reigns in your heart. Because the true righteous ones, the true sheep of the Lord's flock said, really? When when did I go visit the sick? When did I go to prison? When did I clothe someone? When did I feed somebody? I don't remember. It's because they weren't doing it. Because they were trying to earn brownie points with God. They were doing it because it was natural. It was their new man. It was their new selves doing it. But it was never true for the goats. Oh, dear one, there's no reason on earth for you to go your own way. Christ made Himself a curse for you. Christ took the displeasure of God for you. Christ took the wrath of God for you. Why on earth would you want to repeat it and say, nah, no thanks. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. That's just plain stupidity. 
It's absolutely ridiculous to think that. Listen, listen to Isaiah 53. It's, it's, you just can't get beyond it. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement. That's the whipping that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. We are all sheep. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Verse 8, By oppression and judgment He was taken away. And as for His, as for his generation who considered that He was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And finally, verses 10 and 11, yet it was the will of the Lord Yahweh to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, guilt, Why? Why would we pass over and say this offering that took my guilt, my stain, my displeasure of God, the wrath of God from me, why would we overlook that and say it's not important? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 says, How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Oh my goodness, no. Please, no. Don't. Don't do that. Because verse 14 here and back in Galatians 3 says this, He was cursed for us, verse 14, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive... Oh, isn't this incredible? So that we would receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. So we move from being cursed by God because Jesus Christ took our curse for us into having new birth, The Spirit of God taking our rock-hard hearts, turning them into hearts of flesh on which the laws of God are written, making it so that from 1 John chapter 5, we delight in doing the will of God, the, 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 the law of God, that it makes us happy to walk with God, that we wake up anticipating fellowship with God. And that we have, even though we struggle with assurance from time to time, below it all, beyond anything else, we say, my beloved is mine and I am His. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Christ took your curse and mine. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, no justice was done to the amazing reality that Jesus Christ became a curse for us. But the words were stated. And it is beyond human comprehension that you so wanted your elect that you willingly marched, neither turning to the left or to the right, you marched to Jerusalem to do it, to be made a curse for us. 
And then you rose from the dead proving that you can take away the curse, the wrath of God, the displeasure of God on our part. And we praise you for it. What more can be said? We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.